bit of confusion, maybe one, the slide where my name is written correctly. <laughs> Anyways, who of you here is working in websites or apps? Oh, cool, I'm in the right room. So, good news. There is over a billion websites on the internet live today. Over a billion websites. That's <laughs> over a billion blogs, over a billion news pages, over a billion shops, over a billion uh, social networks, web apps, over a billion startups all together. And the question, how can we stand out? How can we create something that stands out from that crowd, from that mass of mediocrity? How can we convince people to go to our website and not to our competitors? Well, I do exactly that. My name is Joe, I'm a designer from Berlin, and I convince people. I convince people to read in a space where they usually would not read, just through design and technology. I convince people to cook and get creative with their food, just through design. I convince people. I seduce people. I do what I call seductive design. And I also write books about that topic, so my uh, current book is called Web Fatale, and it's, it's exactly about that, how to be irresistible and how to create websites that are irresistible. Um, you should definitely read it, of course. But now you could say, Joe, this is just a fancy word for user experience design, right? So I did some research. I asked the internet, what is user experience, and what's user experience design? And if you ask the internet, it will tell you that. So user experience is bypassing what a designer created and basically using that trampled path around that uh, created concrete. Really? If you ask the internet, user experience is a plastic bottle and not the glass bottle. But that's just ketchup. When you ask the internet, user experience, I have no idea what that is. You really find that. I mean, there's a ton of analogies. There's a ton of examples. And none of them really take into account the core of user experience design, experiences. So let's make our own analogy and let's talk a bit about experiences. Who of you has never, 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 ever been on a roller coaster? Yeah, thank you for being honest. Okay, let me walk you through it. So before you get on the roller coaster, you will have to line up. So you'll wait in the queue for one hour, two hours, three hours, depending on how popular the ride is. And then it will get really, really boring. You will yeah, get cold, you will get tired, you will get anxious. The closer you get, the louder the screams from the roller coaster are. And you ask yourself, oh my god, do I really want that? And then you get in. You will have all the twists and twirls and all the g-forces and the falls and all the screams, you will experience that yourself for like 90 seconds. And after that it's over and you get one of those pictures. And you will tell your friends about it, how great it was. You will tell your co-workers about it. You will tell your grandchildren about it. And that's what I call an experience. When you tell your grandchildren about it, it's definitely an experience. So this experience, those 90 seconds, they can only live because what's happening before and after the experience. Because the time you have been awaiting it and the time you spend reflecting about it, telling others about it, that's what makes the experience. That what, that's what uh, reasons it. And this does not only count for big experiences like roller coaster rides, but also for small experiences. I got something for you and let's try out if that works. Who of you knows what that is? Yeah? Who, who said yes? Here you go. So I got a couple. Maybe one for the back as well. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. One for you. Maybe you can also pass it through. One for you. One for you. Okay, one for you, two more, uh, one for you, and one for you, you. Thank you, okay, so this is a confetti cannon. 
you operate it by holding it above your head, high above your head, and turn it. But don't turn, turn it now. <laughs> Everyone who does not have one, I need your help now. You need to give me a countdown from five downwards. And then everyone who has a cannon, when the countdown ends, you need to pop it. <laughs> Got that? Okay, let's start. Hold it above your head. Give me a countdown. Five, four, four three, two, one. <laughs> Woo! That looks awesome. Oh my god, the Ahoy guys are so going to kill me. <laughs> Congratulations, you've just been part of an experience. <laughs> and al although in that experience the anticipation phase was like a minute or so, and the actual experience was like a second, and by far not as great as a roller coaster ride, the reflection phase will be so much longer. It will actually last until you find the last confetti bits in your hair tonight when you go to bed. And yeah, so that's an experience. And experience is equal seduction, right? So that's what seduction is about. Now, you could argue, Joe, your examples, this is fun experience. It's a roller coaster ride, that's fun. Confetti cannons, that's fun. But my website isn't that fun. I work for a bank, I work for an insurance company. How can that be fun? Now, let's talk about fun for a second. Fun. Fun is not about being funny. Fun is also not about jokes. Fun is not about crazy animations, cool characters, anything. Fun is about interaction, about interaction and feedback. It's about giving the user something they can touch, something that will react to the user, that will give something back to them, both in big, but also in small scale, macro feedback and micro feedback. From big interfaces to tiny interface elements that tell you what they're doing just through feedback. Fun is about curiosity, about surprise, it's about the question, what's going to happen when I click on that little scissor in the footer of Kickstarter just all the way through until the end of the screen? And of course, I'm not going to tell you. You can find that out yourself. Fun, fun experiences will speak to you like human beings. They have edges. They're not perfect. They will swear a lot. They have personality. But that's what fun is about. And the most important thing, fun experiences don't just happen. You need to create them. Fun experiences need to be designed and your users need to be guided through them. Now, how does it work? How do you guide users through an experience? What's the best way? And I thought about that a lot and I was able to identify seven phases, seven phases in that guiding process. And the easiest way to describe those phases is with our favorite Swedish furniture shop, IKEA. So let's go on a little trip through IKEA. The first thing you do is you come to IKEA, you, um, you will uh, park your car, you go to the bathroom, you eat in the restaurant, some lunch maybe, and then you drop your kids in the whirlpool and you're off. You prepare yourself for the next three hours of shopping. Um, you clear the stage. And on the internet, we do exactly the same. When we enter a new website, we ask ourselves, is that provider trustworthy? How do I contact them? Do they only have a call center in India or is it somebody I can call, like a real person in Germany? And those guys, although their website is not the most beautiful in the world, they answer all of these questions in the very first viewport. Now that's a perfect uh, clearing the stage experience here. But it's even simpler. It's just about answering the question, what am I going to do on that website? Is this shop just another Amazon? Or is it something more inspiring? Inspiration. Now, you're on that escalator up to the exhibition and you find all these living rooms beautifully designed and giving you ideas on what you could do with the furniture. And on the internet, we do exactly the same. The homepage of Airbnb, for example, they will not only give you the, uh, the search bar, but they will also suggest you to cross, crush with Torsten or uh, to spend a night in Budapest. And um, it's about giving you an idea what you can do with a product. Is that productivity tool I'm using only good for managing my startup? Or is it also something I could use to plan my wedding or manage a bucket list? Now this gives you ideas on how to use a product. 
And now, when you're inspired, it's time for decisions. It's time to get down to the hard facts and it's time to make the best possible decision. And the more facts you have, the better your decision can be and the more confident you feel about it. In best case, you will tell your users not only what they will get, but also what they don't get. So things that are excluded from, uh, yeah, from the decision-making process. Or you can give them an, an opportunity to compare probably a product against another model or um, yeah, a product against a competitor's product. This will really help you to make that big decision. And once that's made, once you went through all these steps and through all the possible options, you made that decision, you're always a bit unsure. And this is the right time to utilize emotions. At IKEA, that's no coincidence that the candles and the plants and the picture frames come right after the big furniture. It's as if this cactus would scream at you, hey, yeah, I would look so good on your new coffee table. And that's exactly what it does. It justifies the big decision I made by doing smaller decisions, by doing low involvement decisions. You know that from Amazon. When you buy that one big, expensive camera, you'll always get suggested to get a battery and to get an SD card. And this justifies your decision of buying a big camera. But, oh, yeah, but I have the battery now, so it's fine to have the big camera. Or if you're on German Amazon store, it will tell you to get a pouch to not scratch that expensive camera. Um, who's really good at that is travel sites and car rental sites. Once you went through all the cars and you picked the car that fits the best to your budget, and you're kind of happy already, you get to the section that says recommended protection options. And there you see words like loss damage, roadside protection, personal accident, oh my god. I take all of those just to be safe. And by having my attention on these small decisions, I don't think about the big one anymore, and I don't question it anymore. It's justified. Now, I still haven't been through the checkout. I still haven't paid yet. How, how can we make sure that people don't jump off in the last second? This brings us to the phase of involvement. Did you know that a customer, a potential customer, who was able to touch the product with their hands is four times more likely to actually buy it than somebody who just looked at it. Well, the guys at Holtz Connection know. Holtz Connection, German furniture store, and what they do is they will send you a free wooden sample pack. So no strings attached, you don't have to enter your credit card details, anything. You just get these little wooden chips. And this is really cool for you to feel what your new furniture might feel like, what it would smell like, what it would look like in real life, and to get you involved with the brand. But not everybody can send out free stuff. Mr. Specs, for example, they sell glasses online and they let you try them on with your webcam. <laughs> and even though it's more of a joke, it lets you interact with the product. Interaction, owning the experience. And this brings us to point number six, making yourself hackable. Letting the users own you, letting the users own the experience, letting the, them trick you maybe a bit. The American uh, apparel site, Agmonk, has a really cool way of doing that. They will give you a 15% discount that you can only unlock when you're about to leave the page. So in the moment you're in the address bar already typing a new address, you will get that model that says, oh wait, you'll get another 15%. And the cool thing about that is not only that you get those 15%, it's a you get that feeling of having tricked you these 15%, of having tricked the store owner. And that lets you own the experience. It's a kind of reward. Now, let's be honest. How many of you, after being at IKEA, go directly to the hot dog stand? I'm, I'm guilty too. Well, it's not, and let's be really honest, it's not about that we're so hungry for hot dogs. It's just a kind of reward. We deserve that hot dog. We just survived three hours of IKEA. We need to have that hot dog. And that's something that really works well. And that also works well on the internet. Telling your users, well, that thing that you just did, that was great. Good stuff, man. Really good job. Um, that's really important. And that also reinforces a positive behavior and um, yeah, gives your people, give to, give to users some kind of uh, emotional reward. 
or simply saying thank you, thank you for sticking around, for being part of the experience, that also helps. Now, all of those seven phases can really help you to, use, to guide a user through an experience and to create a good and seductive experience. However, this can only work if you know where you're going, if you have a goal. And I admit, all of these examples are from e-commerce and shopping sites, but it's not only about e-commerce and shopping, it's actually um, about all kinds of experiences. It also can change the way that you design and it can change the mindset that you design with. In the beginning I had that example of the Aside magazine. So when we went out to make the Aside magazine, an HTML5 based magazine for the iPad, we asked ourselves how can we use web technology, how can we use HTML to make people read and to give them a magazine-like experience just through something that works technically like a website. So the challenge is usually on, an, on the internet, on a CMS, you would have just dropped content into a template and then uh, delivered it to the user, but this does not give you a magazine-like experience. So how can we convince people to read that through design? And this is actually just what editorial design is. So we went out, we found images that work well together with the text. Um, we structured the text, of course, headlines, paragraphs, sections. And then we took all of the stuff that were necessary, were necessary, we just took them out and we allowed white space and we simplified the content. And then we even went a step further and said, okay, hmm, maybe not all of these texts need a textual representation, maybe an infographic here or an illustration would work much better. And in the end, we had to make sure that the design, that the tonality had to, or reflected what the content was about. And if you think about it, this, these five steps, um, basically the five steps of um, editorial design, this is about creating something that seduces people, that convinces people to read. Now, great experiences come through great design. Great design can create great experiences. And great experiences can help you to convince people, can seduce people. And this is just a reminder that user experience design is not about ketchup bottles, and it's not about lemon slices. It's about anticipation and reflection. It's about involvement, about fun, about reward. It's about not creating the one billionth and first website. It's about making the web a better place and creating fantastic websites, creating fantastic experiences, and to create more confetti cannons, create more roller coasters. Thank you.